Dan Putt. I'm a licensed professional chemical engineer. It's 2019, and in many ways, it's been a, a difficult year. We've had mass shootings and political gridlock, and it's all been amplified through that echo chamber of social media. So it can be easy to be pessimistic. But if we look at the progress that's been made in recent history, we find a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Today we're going to talk about that progress with respect to three elements, elements which make up our bodies and whose history is one of moving from scarcity to abundance. In terms of optimism, the early 1800s were one of the most optimistic times in history. The French and the American revolutions had just taken place, and thinkers of the so-called Enlightenment imagined how advances in science and democracy would come to improve the human condition. But among them was a pessimist, an economist by the name of Thomas Malthus. So Malthus looked at the data and he said, as things improve, the population will increase exponentially, whereas the food supply will continue to increase linearly. Ultimately, the population will outstrip the food supply and we will be in a state of continuous Famine. So it's been 200 years. We can ask who was right. If you were alive in the 1870s, and I didn't see anyone here that was, <laughs> you, you might have thought Malthus. So the population then was a little bit over a billion, but the death rate from famine was about two million per year. Today, the population is five times as high, but the death rate is about 39,000. Again, it's still much too high, but that's 98% lower than what it was. So it appears that the optimists were mostly right. So how did this come to be? So if Malthus were a biochemist, he might have articulated his limit more precisely. The compound on this slide, biochemist report, is one of the most difficult that they work with. It's, it's volatile, it's explosive. It can have just an overbearing odor this, of course, is a human being. <laughs> so the elements on this, on this compound is technically a mixture, you're not one big molecule. Um, they have to be replenished through food, water, and air. We're going to talk about three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We'll call these the elements of optimism. So we'll start with nitrogen. Nitrogen is in every one of your proteins. It's in every strand of your DNA. It's also the most abundant element in the atmosphere. But atmospheric nitrogen, they bond strongly in pairs, and they're very fond of one another. <laughs> so in order for animals to get nitrogen in a usable form, we need either a lightning strike or the use of specialized bacteria. Um, so, so in the time following Malthus, there were these, the natural sources began to run out and these nitrogen booms began to take place. And one of the first sources was actually bird droppings. So there were these islands of guano in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and for a brief time they became the most valuable real estate on Earth. But as these began to dwindle and as conflicts were fought over them, people realized this, this whole endeavor was too risky. The whole thing was something of a, a crapshoot. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, there were other sources, but these had similar risk as well. So people looked to extract nitrogen from its most abundant source, and that was, of course, the atmosphere. One of these people was Carl Bosch. So Bosch was a chemist, but he didn't fit the mold of other chemists at his company, BASF. While they tended to keep their hands clean, Bosch was more comfortable loosening his tie and working and tinkering in the lab. So his methods, they had proven themselves. As a young man, he had proven himself on a series of difficult projects. So he was given a team of chemists and engineers to investigate a process put forth by Fritz Haber. So Haber's process worked. It took atmospheric nitrogen, it reacted it with hydrogen, and it made ammonia. But there were a few issues. The first was pressure. It operated at 100 atmospheres of pressure. For context, that's like holding a pickup truck on top of your head. Terrible idea. There was no industrial vessel at the time that could contain that pressure. The second problem was a catalyst. So Haber's process used the exceedingly rare catalyst called the osmium. It's an element. 
Bosch's team, in their wisdom, they bought up all the osmium in the world. It amounted to a pile about the size of a beach ball. So, so Bosch's team, they, they put on the montage music and they got to work. They, they would try new catalysts and, and as they did, sometimes the reactors would explode. So they responded by encasing them in concrete. They would, they would increase the pressure and sometimes their valves and their fittings and their compressors would leak. So they responded by inventing new ones. They, they ran into hundreds of problems and they responded with hundreds of practical solutions. Finally, years before anyone thought it was possible, they had a working industrial process. BASF's bet paid off handsomely and Bosch was rewarded by being appointed head of the company. Today, the so-called Haber-Bosch process is responsible for keeping two billion people alive. If you were to look at the nitrogen atoms in your body, 50% of them came through that process. For the next element of optimism, we'll come a little bit closer to home to this indomitable, thought-provoking city of Detroit. This is a pile of bison skulls and a photo taken in 1892, but it wasn't taken on the prairies, it was actually taken in southwest Detroit. Back then, the Motor City's biggest industry wasn't cars, it was cartilage. Michigan Carbon Works would take these bones, they would treat them with sulfuric acid and char them to make what's called bone black. The bone black would then be used as a source of fertilizer. But four years after this image was taken, the bones were gone, depleted by over-harvesting. Today, we still need phosphorus for crops, and we get them from a much more abundant source, a white mineral called apatite, which is appropriately named. For the final element, we'll talk about sulfur. So sulfur used to be mined in open pits in Sicily by boys as young as seven. Today, we get our sulfur by sort of a roundabout recycling process, because in the 1990s, Diesel fuel had 30 times the sulfur as it does today. And we would, we would burn this fuel, it would become sulfur emissions, and it would ultimately become acid rain. Today, refiners like Marathon recover that sulfur, and among other things, it becomes fertilizer for sulfur-deficient soils in Africa and Asia. So, wrapping up, we see that the optimists were generally right. We've gone from one billion people in the 1800s with a life expectancy of 29, unless you're in Europe where it was 34, to 7.7 .7 billion people today with a life expectancy worldwide of 72. In 2100, the world population is expected to stabilize at about 11 billion. And a lot of us won't make it there, but a lot of our kids will, and a lot of our grandkids will. It's going to be a difficult century, but we have reason to be optimistic. We have a track record of overcoming incredibly difficult problems, moving from scarcity to abundance. Using the tools we've used to get here, our common humanity, ethics, and reason, we can leave our descendants an even better future defined by the next elements of optimism. Thank you. Thank you.